Nobody likes getting a report card or getting graded, but who doesn't love giving out grades? So unless on the very outside chance you play for the Kraken, this should be a pretty fun one. What's cracking everybody and welcome to end of the season player grades for the Seattle Kraken. Or at least the guys that played at least 25 games, I had to cut it off somewhere or this would have been way too long of a video. Even at that though, this could still be a fairly long one as there are a number of guys to get through, so let's just get right to it. Now, we're going to start with the guys that did end up getting traded and didn't finish the season with the Kraken. We won't spend too much time here since again, they probably have seen their last game in Seattle at least for the Kraken anyway. On the defensive end, that means Jeremy Lauzon and Mark Giordano, two guys who, outside of both playing defense, had very different roles on this Kraken team. Even still, they both had pretty bad starts to their season. With Mark Giordano, though, he did bounce back in the second half of the season before he ends up getting traded to Toronto, where he ends up wearing the number 55 that's not only Lauzon's number, but is a tribute to the 55 games he played for the Kraken. In the end, I'm giving Giordano a B plus, again with a season that started out as much more of a C, but ended at least for his crack instant as more of an A, so somewhere in the middle there with a B. The reason I bump it up to a B plus is just because of the impact he had from a leadership standpoint in the locker room for a brand new team, obviously as the franchise's first ever captain. Meanwhile, for Lausanne, he never really did bounce back. He did improve, I would say, but not significantly enough to prevent me from in the end, giving him a D. I thought about giving him a C- minus as he did improve as the season went along. Again, though, just a very not great season for the Kraken, to say the least. I know there are some of you out there who are surprised that this isn't an F, but I do think that Lausanne at least offered the Kraken much more of a physical presence than the vast majority of the players on the team did. Sometimes that led to some issues in the defensive end and got him put in the penalty box quite a bit. Plus, the advanced stats all agree that he was the worst player for the team. But again, that physical presence was not quite the same after he left. And of course, on the forward end, the guys that end up getting traded out include Colin Blackwell, Kelly Yarncroak, Marcus Johansson, and Mason Appleton, three of whom are currently in the playoffs. As far as the grades for these guys, for Yarncroak, I ended up giving him an A. He, again, didn't have a great start for the Kraken, but did rebound and had a pretty good middle of the season right up until he ends up getting traded. Plus the fact that the Kraken caught a big return and, and honestly a pretty surprisingly good return from the Flames for Yarn Croak does bring this up from maybe what would have been an A- minus to that A. Colin Blackwell is another guy that improved as the season went along, though for him, the start of the season had a lot more to do with injury issues and starting out the season on the IR rather than not playing well. It just took him a while to get off of that injury and work his way into the lineup, and once he did, especially leading up to his trade, he was making a huge difference for the team, especially on that line with Appleton and Gord. And speaking of Appleton, I ended up giving him a C. I really wanted this to be a higher grade, but in the end, it's as low as it is because I wanted more from Appleton than the Kraken ended up getting. He was certainly one of the players that I looked at as a potential breakout for the Kraken, getting a larger role with them and just running away with it. Unlike McCann and a couple of the other guys, though, that just never really happened for Mason Appleton. While he did offer the Kraken a, a quite a bit as far as the four check and was one of the better players winning puck battles along the boards for them, he just was not a very consistent player or consistent contributor for the Kraken, especially on the score sheet. So again, we finish off with a C. And finally, for Marcus Johansson, I ended up giving him a B. I have to say, he was a guy that, for whatever reason, I just didn't really notice all that much as the season went along. But statistically, he produced for the Kraken with 23 points in 51 games. Plus, again, the return the Kraken got for him in the trade to DC was a pretty good one. So... Yeah, I think B's fair. Getting now to the guys that actually finished the season for the Kraken, we'll start from the back going forward, which means we start with goaltending where... Yeah, things did not go particularly well, especially statistically for the Kraken. Obviously, Grubauer has in a lot of ways been the scapegoat for a lot of people, especially when the national perspective is brought into it. As far as why this season went as bad as it did for the Kraken, with Grubauer having been a Vesna finalist the year before, and now having a well below 900 save percentage in this season for the Kraken. Now for Grubauer, I think that there's a lot more that plays into that whole picture for him. Again, starting out the season on a brand new team, it was going to take him a little while to get used to the team playing in front of him and figure out where those chances were going to come from. Not to mention the fact that with a very inconsistent, slow start for the defense, who was learning how to play together themselves, 
It ended up taking Grubauer quite a while to get his feet under him and figure out how to play behind this Kraken team. Once he did, he had a bit of a resurgence, though even the back half of the season, while certainly better than the front half, was fairly inconsistent, and we'll certainly be looking for a bounce back season from Grubauer next year. So I didn't end up going terrible necessarily with the grade. I mean, it's C minus still isn't very good for Grubauer. It could have been a lot worse. In the end, I give him a bit of the benefit of the doubt rather than what the stats say over some of the extenuating circumstances. For Drieger, again, it's not a lot better. He dealt with a lot of the same things that Grubauer did over the course of the season, though his start of the season was less hampered by how the team was playing in front of him and more by a couple of injuries and then a stent on the COVID protocol. So definitely a hard way for him to start his season and try to get into a groove with a brand new team, much like Grubauer. In the end, though, a save percentage under 900, even though it's just slightly under it, is not going to get you much more than a C. And while he, like Grubauer, did have some hot points over the course of the season, he just wasn't consistent enough, even in the back half, to get much better than that C grade. Though, like Grubauer, I do think the best for Drieger is yet to come, which hopefully still happens in a Kraken jersey, though with that being said, it's not a guarantee, as the Kraken have a bit of a puzzle to figure out in net for next season, where both Decord and Drieger will have to clear waivers in order to remain a part of the Kraken. Now, Drieger's obviously not going to get waived, and Decord probably wouldn't clear waivers if he was, so one of those two guys might end up getting traded before we get to free agency, or the start of next season, I guess. Moving now to the defensive end, going by games played for the Kraken, there really wasn't a lot of turnover on the defensive end over the course of the whole season. Yes, there was some mixing and matching and platooning that went on with the third pairing, and with a couple of guys leaving free agency, we saw a little bit more of that towards the end of the year, but as far as guys that played at least 25 games, there aren't a ton of them. The first one would be Hayden Fleury, who, although he did have a pretty decent start, I thought, to the season. As soon as he got going, he ended up getting benched, which I thought was one of the more questionable coaching decisions of the year, to say the least. And after that happened, it was a pretty frustrating, not terribly great season for Flurry as a whole. In the end, I end up going with a C for him, and I think that could potentially be bumped up to a C plus. There's an argument there with the way he started his season, but again, just not a great last kind of 50 games or so or for him, I guess, kind of last 20 games. Up next is Will Borgen, who, like Flurry, played 36 games for the Kraken this season. And if you watched the review video already, you know that I picked him as my Kraken Calder winner for the season. Now, a large portion of that is because there weren't a lot of guys that were eligible for the Calder on the Kraken roster, but still, I thought a pretty good season from Borgen, at least as far as what I expected from him. He did have some games that weren't particularly great, a few in, or a couple at least in particular that were pretty downright bad, but in general I thought he played well for the Kraken and especially early on in the season. I thought in the games he got in he earned a little bit more of a role than he really got until the end of the year. In the end though he really didn't make a terribly big impact over the course of the season as a again in and out of the lineup third pair defenseman. Well, it was a pretty respectable one, especially considering the role that was expected from him. I don't think that you can go much above a B plus, which is what I'm going to end up giving him here. As far as whether or not or what role he ends up playing for the Kraken next season, that definitely remains to be seen. We'll go over in a looking towards next season video who I actually think will be on the team next year. And Borgen, I don't necessarily think it's a guarantee. Certainly not a guarantee that he's in the starting lineup. But still, as far as this inaugural season is concerned, a pretty decent one, all things considered. Now getting into the guys that spent most of the season in the starting lineup for the Kraken, we start with Carson Soucy, who had one of the best defensive seasons for any Kraken player, especially when it comes to scoring, where he led Kraken defensemen with 10 goals, as well as 11 assists and 21 points, both those 10 goals and 21 points, career highs for Soucy. Now, sure, like honestly, all of the Kraken defensemen this season, his season was far from perfect defensively as he did occasionally let guys past him into odd man breakaways or just straight up breakaways one-on-one -on -one against the goaltender. But with that scoring and a season that did improve defensively as it went along, especially as he became more of a mainstay in the lineup and got out of that platoon that he was weirdly in at the start of the season, it was a good season for him, again, leading the team in scoring and goal production on the defensive end. So I think it's hard to go with anything other than an A for him. Next up is the big rig Jamie Oleksiak, who, unlike Susie, really didn't offer the Kraken much when it came to points production, especially goal scoring, where he only had one on the season. But what he did offer the Kraken is more what was advertised, and that was probably the largest physical presence, especially 
from a hits perspective that the Kraken had on their team all season long. Really, the only guy that would compete for him with some big hits would be Lausanne, though with Alexiak, his big hits were a little bit better timed than some of Lausanne's were. In the end though, I only ended up giving Alexiak a B- on the season, which really doesn't have anything to do with his scoring output since that's not really the role he's meant to be playing. It has a lot more to do with the fact that while I think his start to the season was much more in the A range, the end of the season I thought was much more of a C- or maybe even a D where he made a lot of defensive mistakes, lots of turnovers, and honestly, it seemed like the energy, especially as it became clear the Kraken weren't going to make the playoffs, kind of just came out of his game and a lot of those hits went with it. So again, a pretty uneven season from Alexiak and something that we'd like to see a lot more of that start of the season Alexiak throughout the entire season next year. And if we do, it would definitely help this team win a few more games. With Vince Dunn, I kind of waffled a bit on what grade to give him. I started out at a B, went to B+, and eventually landed on an A-. minus. I could be convinced to go even up to an A potentially or back down to a B, so let me know what you think down in the comments. But this was a season from Dunn that, as the leading scorer for the Kraken defensively, I thought was a pretty good one and definitely one that, for the most part, he took advantage of the expanded role he got with Seattle especially being able to quarterback the second power play unit and eventually first power play unit once Geo left to Toronto via trade. So again, for Dunn, I would say a pretty good season for him, especially considering what was expected and what he'd done in the past. In the end, finishing with a career high in assists with 28 and tied for career high in points with 35, which again led the team from the blue line. Now, the only reason I didn't have done at, say, an A, or certainly not an A+, is for two reasons. One, seven goals does seem a bit low from what the Kraken would eventually like to see him be at, and more so had to do with how he started the season defensively. Now, he did improve drastically as the season went along, and really finished the season strong on the defensive end, preventing the puck from getting past him and preventing opposing players from getting past him with the puck specifically. Though the start of the season, it did seem like, especially as the Kraken were having trouble winning games, he pressed a little bit too much and was trying to do too much himself, especially on the power play, which led to some of those odd man rushes and breakaways for opposing teams. Again, he was able to clean that up, and as long as he can keep doing that going into next season, we could be looking at a pretty good season for Dunn coming up here in 2022-23. And finally on the defensive end, the only Kraken player to play all 82 games, it's Adam Larson, who, as you can see, the advanced stats were not a particularly big fan of the season he had for Seattle. And I mean, sure, he didn't have a perfect season by any means, and there were a number of times that the puck, thanks in part to a play that he made, ended up in the back of the net, but honestly... I thought he was more often than any other player on the team a victim of bad luck, specifically in the defensive end, where most notably on a number of occasions he had a puck go off either a skate or his stick and pass the Kraken goaltender into the goal, getting a few own goals on the season. Again, uh, none of those are obviously intentional, and in most cases I thought he was trying to do the right thing, it's just a bad bounce. Plus, he was at least in front of the net, which is something that the Kraken kind of struggled with at points in the season. And to be fair, at the other end of the ice, he did have a by far career high in putting the puck in the opposing net, doubling his previous career high, which was four with eight goals on the season, which coupled with his 17 assists, got him to a second to done 25 points from the blue line. Moving now to the forward end again by games played, we'll start with the two guys that I had as exceptions to that 25 game rule. And we'll start, of course, with the guy that played the fewest games of anyone we're going to talk about, and one that I really only included because of how much fun it is to talk about the 10 games that he played. And that, of course, is Matty Beneers. Again, I really don't know what more there is to say about Beneers' start for the Kraken in those final 10 games that hasn't already been said by me or a number of other people that have talked about the Kraken. Nine points in his first 10 NHL games, and well, sure, if you want to nitpick, he kind of did make a lot of that happen through individual effort rather than looking like a cohesive part of the team as a whole. But, I mean, he is a 19-year-old that just came up at the end of the season to play his first NHL game, so I think that's kind of to be expected. And in the end, those 9 points in those 10 games and the way he played for the Kraken, looking like, in most cases, the most talented player on the ice when he was out there, I don't see any choice but to give him an A+. The second of those two players that just missed that 25-game cutoff, though in this case it is just barely as he ended up playing 23 games for the Kraken, largely after the trade deadline, would be Cole Lind, who again I thought played very well for the Kraken, especially after he came up post-trade deadline. The few games he got in before that I didn't think really made a huge impact, and 
largely was not super noticeable, but really played well again coming up in those last couple of months or last month and a half. Now, sure, when it comes to Lin's success late in the season, you could point to the fact that he got to spend a good amount of time on a line with Yanni Gord, and the two of them really seemed to have some immediate chemistry. Plus, even in spite of being on that line and the chances that those two were able to generate, he only ended up getting eight points on two goals and six assists. So yeah, that could have been a lot more, though again, I think he got robbed on a number of occasions, and given that same level of play over a larger span of time, that would certainly come up quite a bit. So in the end, I do think you could make a pretty good argument for Lind getting an A on the season, and while his end of the season was certainly an A, if not maybe even an A+, plus, if you want to be generous, I am going to end up giving him an A-, minus. and well, maybe this is nitpicking, that's because the games that he did get in early on in the season Again, really just not much of an impact, and had he made more of an impact in those games, maybe we would have got to see him a little bit more prior to that trade deadline. Another guy that made most of his impact for the Kraken late in the season and once again did it on a line with Yanni Gord, though this time had more to do with the fact that he was a mid-season waiver claim and then spent a stint on the injured list, is of course Carson Kuhlman, who just barely gets to 25 games, and like Lind has two goals and six assists for eight points in those games, but again, contributed to what could have easily been more points than that. Now with Kuhlman, again like Lind, I was very impressed with the end of the season that he had, and is another guy that I really hope to see in the lineup next season for the Kraken. With him specifically, it's still not guaranteed considering he is an RFA, so the Kraken would have to re-sign him in the offseason, but I think there's a good chance of that happening considering the role that he was given there at the late part of the season on that line with not just Gord, but McCann in those final couple of weeks. Now, I did end up giving him a B plus rather than an A-, because while he did produce at the offensive end, or at least create the chances that would lead to production, at the defensive end, it was somewhat inconsistent. There were some good plays and some really not so great plays and missed assignments and stuff like that that you would like to see cleaned up. Still though, a pretty good outing in a fairly small sample size there at the end of the season, so I think a B plus is fair. Up next is Brandon Tanev, and again, what more can you say about the season or what there was of Brandon Tanev's season? Certainly the spark plug of the team and the energy driver on the bench in the 30 games he was able to play before missing the rest of the season via injury. Again, like I said in that review video, with Tanev, when he left and went out with that injury, his absence in the lineup was more apparent immediately than any other player that the Kraken lost to injury over the course of the season including the guys obviously that came back, but even more so than when they had lost McCann a couple of times, Eberly, or even Schwartz when those guys were the leading scorers at the time they went out of the lineup. Tanev's absence was immediately apparent, and really, the team never looked the same after he went down. With all that having been said, and as much as we are looking forward to hopefully a full season of Tanev next year, I don't think I can give 30 games much more than an A. Certainly could have been an A+, plus had he continued to play that way over the course of the rest of the season, had he been able to. But, I mean, yeah, I did give Beneers an A-plus with just 10 games, but that's a little different. He's 19 years old, and those were the first 10 games of his career. Tanev, though, still an A with, again, could have been an A-plus without the injury. And speaking of seasons that were hampered by injuries that could have been a lot better had they not been, Jaden Schwartz easily could have been the leading point scorer for the Kraken had it not been for his two injuries late in the season that prevented that from happening. Even with that, he ends up putting up 23 points in 37 games. Again, though, I can't give him much more of an A. I almost gave him an A-, minus, but that seemed a little bit harsh. Still, it's an A just because of the number of games that he did end up having to miss. Jumping up now from 37 games up to 69, and the rest of these guys that spent most of the season in the lineup for the Kraken, we start with Riley Sheehan, who, I mean, I ended up giving him a C. Again, I don't really know how much was expected from Shan coming into the season. He was just kind of a depth piece that ended up playing as many games as he did, largely because of the injury issues the Kraken had on the forward end, but really didn't produce all that much. And outside of a couple of good games from the fourth line late in the season, really was not all that noticeable at all. In fact, probably his biggest contribution to the team was the fact that he wasn't even noticeable in the penalty box, where he only had two minutes in that penalty box in those 69 games, which considering the struggles the penalty kill had on and off throughout the season, probably did prevent a few goals from happening. Next, with an easily career-high 73 games played, it's Morgan Geeky who got a massively expanded role on the Kraken from what he had seen previously. 
Now, I did end up giving Geeky a B because, well, he had a fantastic start to the season and a pretty good finish to it as well. The middle of the season, he did go through some pretty big periods of time where he was largely a non-factor and just not really noticeable whatsoever, which played a pretty big role, I think, in that 22 points that he finishes in those 73 games with. That having been said, I still gave him a B on the year because, again, he was one of the younger players for the Kraken, and this was his first full season on an NHL roster, plus the 7 goals, 15 assists, and 22 points he ended with were all career highs. Now, if next season he can have a bit of a more consistent year as far as making an impact, that would be nice to see, and I think it's definitely there, especially considering, like I mentioned in that review video, outside of Donskoy and maybe Everly, though, honestly, I think Geeky's probably in second here. He was probably the second most snake-bitten player by the Kraken all season long, certainly could have ended up on the score sheet more than he did, and probably deserved to. Now, before we get to this next one, I know there are probably going to be some of you who think I've been a bit generous as this has gone along, and I haven't given out very many low grades at all. In fact, there isn't a single F that I gave out at all to Kraken player this season, and only the one D to Lausanne. And considering the way the season went, that definitely could be different if you were a little bit more harsh with these grades. Honestly, even though the season didn't go great and not all the Kraken had great seasons, I still like these players enough that maybe this is looking at it with a bit of rose-tinted glasses. All that having been said, this next grade is one that I would not be surprised if a lot of people think is a little bit on the low end. Which, considering I still gave him an A, is saying a lot, and that is Yanni Gord. Now I know a lot of people are going to want an A plus here. The only reason I gave Gordon A rather than an A plus is because his 48 points on 21 goals and 27 assists, while it was second on the team, does still seem a bit low from what I was expecting out of Gord this season. I thought for sure he would be at least a 50 point player. Maybe that was a bit unfair considering he was going from a back to back Stanley Cup champion team to an expansion team. But still, even though he was easily the second best player for the Kraken, I would say you could make an argument for the best. I have McCann as my MVP for the Kraken. I think that he could have made a bigger impact. Though again, that is certainly nitpicking quite a bit, and it was a fantastic season for Gord, and a well-earned fan favorite as well. Plus, I think it is well worth mentioning that Gord getting the Kraken Selkie, I think is a give me as well, easily the best defensive forward the Kraken had, and again, didn't let that energy fade at all throughout the course of the season, even once the Kraken got eliminated from the playoffs, and even considering the team and playoff runs that he went on over the last couple of years. He was still forechecking like an absolute madman, even to the final game of the season. So again, if you do want to give Gordon A+, I won't argue too much with you on that. Honestly, for me, it just came down to the fact that A+, is I only gave out two incredibly exceptional seasons, and to me, there were really only two Kraken players that were worthy of that. One, of course, being Beneers, who only played 10 games, so even that's maybe being a bit generous. And the other one is the guy that we're talking about next, and that is Jared McCann. Again, the MVP for the Kraken in the season, led the team in goals and points with 27 goals and 50 points on the season, both career highs for him, on top of the 23 assists that he had, also being a career high. So yeah, fantastic season for McCann. Really not a lot negative to say about this one. And another guy who, like Gord, did not let his energy or effort fade at all towards the end of the season, even once the Kraken were eliminated from the playoffs. And in McCann, even in the case where he really looked like he was battling through some injuries in those last couple of weeks of the season, Rather than calling it early, he still went out there pretty much every night, and while they did try to limit his ice time a little bit towards the end of the season, he was out there producing, and producing well for Seattle, even though his goals did fall off a little bit after signing that contract. And again, for McCann, it's also well worth mentioning that while the Kraken power play had plenty to complain about, in fact, there really wasn't a whole lot that went right for the Kraken on the power play at all during the course of the season, the one bright spot of the Kraken power play the entire season was pretty much McCann, who led the team in power play goals with eight, the next highest being four, and was tied for the lead in power play assists with nine, Vince Dunn being the other that had that many. Now I will say that I'm not too sure where McCann's ceiling is, and I'm not sure it's that much higher than where he got this year, so if he continues to be the leading points producer for this team going forward, that could continue being a problem for this team, where you definitely like to see at least 
more than one player get more than 50 points on the year, especially with the scoring outburst league-wide that we saw this season. Still though, that's not to take away at all from the season that McCann did have, which was a fantastic one for the Kraken, and we all look forward to some more great seasons from McCann in the years to come. Another guy who played 74 games for the Kraken over the course of the season, like the two players before him, and like McCann before him, also set career highs, or at least tied a career high, in points, goals, and assists, is Ryan Donato, whose 16 goals and 31 points were both career highs and the 15 assists equals his previous career high as well. For Donato, who was paid near the minimum on a one-year deal for the Kraken coming in free agency, an absolutely unexpectedly great season from him. Sure, it's not a super big standout season in the grand scheme of things if you don't take into account things like contract and what was expected coming into the season, but based on what we thought Donato was going to be, which was basically a depth role player coming into the year, he far exceeded that. And well, he doesn't end up getting an A-plus from me, though I considered it because of his inconsistencies to say the least defensively. Offensively, he was really the only player that the Kraken had that was consistently willing to shoot first and pass second. <laughs> which, well, like again I said in the review video, having guys that pass first is a perfectly good thing to have a number of those guys. You also need a few guys that are willing to shoot first as well. And for the Kraken, Donato was pretty much the only one that was willing to do that on a consistent basis. And especially with how frustrating it was at times to watch the Kraken overpass the puck and in a lot of cases pass their ways out of scoring opportunities, having a guy like Donato who was again willing to shoot whenever he had a chance to was definitely refreshing over the course of the season. One other guy who did have a bit of that shoot first mentality early on in the season Though, when it didn't work out for him, kind of just let that part of his game disappear in the second half of the season, was Jonas Donskoy. Easily the most snake-bitten player and the guy that had the hardest luck at the offensive end for the Kraken in the first half of the season. And unfortunately, that seemed to affect his confidence scoring-wise in the back half of the year where he largely became a non-factor for the Kraken in the last couple of months and even started getting scratched off of the fourth line in a couple of occasions. He was one of the few Kraken players that was consistently getting out in front of the net, trying to deflect pucks, screen the goaltender, or pick up rebounds to put those in. Something that, especially early on in the season, the Kraken really had trouble doing in any kind of consistent manner outside of Donskoy, and that did kind of persist as the season went along. Though for Donskoy, he didn't necessarily keep going to the net. Again, that kind of fell off with his offensive confidence with that lack of scoring until February, where he eventually scored two. The only two of the season, and easily a career low for him. Now, he did also score a couple of times in shootout, which was great for the Kraken as well, but those don't count for the score sheet. Still though, even with that being said, considering the season he had and the fact that he was one of the few Kraken players that definitely got worse as the season went along, I think the C is more than fair to give him here. We'll hope for a better season next year, and... I'm certainly hoping for it. He was, like Appleton, one of the guys that I was most excited to see play for the Kraken coming into this season. As we get towards the end, the second to last player to give a grade out to here, missing just three games on the season for the Kraken, is Jordan Eberle, who had a fantastic season for the Kraken with 44 points in those 79 games with 21 goals and 23 assists. On top of that being the first ever Kraken player to appear in an All-Star game, and win the Pacific Division MVP in that All-Star game, scoring a goal in it. For the vast majority of games, he made a positive impact, and that's not something that could be said about the majority of the players on this roster. One of the most consistent players for the Kraken, even if his scoring or luck when it comes to scoring was not particularly consistent, where he went through bursts of scoring like he certainly probably should have been all season long, but then had a couple of stints of just being completely snake bit and going for long periods without getting a puck into the net. And not for a lack of trying or the opportunities to do so. He started out the season with, I think it was 17 games without a goal, and then later on in the season had, I want to say, a 22 game stretch with, again, not getting the puck into the back of the net. Both times having a number of opportunities that were either robbed or just barely ended up going off of a post or something like that. So, like Gord, I did end up giving him an A rather than an A+, which you could probably make an argument as well for Eberly that he could get there, though I think it's easier to make that argument for Gord. Again, for Eberly, it just has to do with the fact that 44 points is probably less than I was expecting from him. Even still, it's third best on the team, and... Certainly a good output considering how scoring went for this team. 
Plus, again, he easily could have had more considering the opportunities that were there for him. Even still, I am definitely looking forward to what these next couple of seasons hold for Eberly, who does still have two years left on his contract and will probably spend all of at least the first season and, depending on trade deadline, both of those seasons with the Kraken. And for what it's worth, outside of probably Chris Drieger, he did give the best postgame interviews, which, considering how dull some of those hockey player interviews can be, is saying quite a bit. And finally, missing just two games all season for the Kraken is Alex Wenberg. And I gotta say, for Wenberg, he was probably, honestly, I would say pretty easily the most improved player for the Kraken from how he started the season to how he finished it. At the start of the season, really through the first half of it, I gotta say, there were points where I thought he should have been scratched to get guys like Donskoy or Geeky who weren't in the lineup every night back into it. And that's definitely not something I say lightly, considering again, the Kraken signed him as a free agent in the offseason to that deal that pays him four and a half million dollars for the next three years. Or I guess the next two years, three including the one that we just had. It really was that bad of a start, at least to me, for Wenberg to this season. Honestly, his first half of the year, I would probably have to give him a D, maybe a D plus if that's a thing, or a C minus. In the end, he did have a much, much better finish to the season. Honestly, I'd probably give him an A for his finish to the season. In the end, probably balancing out to somewhere around a B minus for the entire year, but he did finish the season really strong for the Kraken. Had that absolute beauty of a goal against... Who was that? I, I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was like Ottawa or someone, but an absolute beauty of a goal that he had there at one point in the season, beating a number of guys defensively and then deking out the goaltender to score it. And it wasn't the only great play that Wenberg had. Again, as some of you may very well know, that's just kind of been the story of the career of Alex Wenberg. The talent has always definitely been there for him to beat players like we saw him do on occasion and put pucks in the back of the net or create dangerous chances with beautiful passes. Again, another thing we saw him do on a number of occasions, Sometimes maybe even passing a little bit too much and being too eager to go for that pass rather than shooting himself, but either way, creating some dangerous chances. The problem has been getting that talent to show up in a consistent manner, which is how he ended up leaving Columbus for Florida, where last year he had a great season, and that's what got him the contract with the Kraken. Now, if he can just put a full season together of what he did in the back half of this one, then I think the future for Wemberg in the Kraken is a pretty good one. And so with all of that, and now that we've given a grade to all of the players that played a significant amount of time for the Kraken this season, before we close things out, I do want to quickly do a end of the season, full season, three stars for the Kraken. It's something we started doing in the R&Rs towards the end, but I think is going to stick around for next year. So on the whole for the season for the Kraken, the first star, again, he's the MVP of the team. It's Jared McCann. The second star, I don't think it's too hard to figure out who that's going to be. It's obviously Yanni Gord. I would say pretty likely the captain for the team next season. And then the third star, I did want to go with the defenseman so we didn't have just all forwards as the three stars. And while I almost gave it to Vince Dunn and thought about Carson Soucy as well, if the two of them had just kind of combined their seasons, I think I could have easily given it to that. But instead, I think it's hard to ignore that Eberly was the third most impactful player for the Kraken over the course of this season. So I'm going to give the third star to Eberly. But as always, again, I'd love to know what you guys think down in the comment section below, who your three stars of the season would be for the Kraken, and what players you might grade differently from what I did, or maybe which ones you agree with. That having been said, we have reached the end of what was probably a decently long video. So if you made it to this point, thank you very much for watching. If you did like or enjoy this video, there are buttons for that kind of stuff down below that help support the channel. So I appreciate you using them. And until next time, be good to each other. God bless and go Kraken.